Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Man, it is a wonderful Christmas tide season. It is, as Pastor Adam said, in those 12 days of Christmas. Yes, the ones that we so often sing about, but rather, rather than golden rings and partridges and pear trees, these 12 days of Christmas are a celebration of God who took on flesh who dwelled among us, the one who would enter into our hurt and our pain and the brokenness of humanity in order to redeem it, to bring perfect healing, to crack open the darkness with his glorious light. As we said on Christmas Eve, this is a season when we sing and when we praise and when we worship. You know, there is a, there's an author and theologian and pastor that I like to follow on Instagram by the name of Rich Viadus. And Rich, Rich says this, he says, you know, Christmas, Christmas is not just a one-day thing. It's a season, and a season that lasts until Epiphany, until January 6th. He says the feast, the feast continues And in a world of rapidly changing, trending topics, we move on too fast to the next thing. As American Christians, we know how to start a thing, but we don't know how to sustain a thing. We are in a season, one in which we should rest for 12 days to sustain this praise and this worship and this singing to the God who would take on flesh and move into our midst. But friends, it's also the new year. So happy new year. Welcome to 2022. Uh, These past two years uh, for me have at times felt like a decade. And while that's true, I personally am looking forward to what God has in store for the upcoming year. See, I'm I'm resting in his promises, I'm resting in his goodness, I'm resting in his faithfulness, I'm committed, like King David in the Psalms, committed to his ways. Uh, King David says this in the Psalms, he says, his ways prosper at all times. And so the new year, the new year for me always brings with it a level of excitement as I get to plot the course for what I hope the year will be, as I think about how I want my life to have meaning, as I prayerfully consider what God wants to do in and through me this year. I mean, it is at this time of the year when we, when we, you and I, when those of us who are in faith, those of us who are trying to be in the ways of Jesus, it is a time of year when we should take to heart what the psalmist says. He says, teach us to number our days so that we can have a heart of wisdom. It's appropriate at the turning of the calendar to take time to reflect, to think about the time we've been given so that the time we have is not wasted. So friends, both in this season of Christmas tide, but also in the turning of our calendar year, we wanna ask the question this morning, what do we have to learn from Jesus as a pre-teenager. What do we have to learn from tween Jesus this morning? How can this tween Jesus actually teach us about plotting a course of wisdom in the year to come? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to turn our attention to Luke chapter 2, which we heard Deanne read just moments ago. I want you to grab a Bible, digital or paper, doesn't matter, and come with me to Luke chapter 2 starting this morning at verse 41. Verse 41, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now, as you're finding that, I know that some of you are astute listeners or you grew up in and around kind of the liturgical tradition, and you're wondering to yourself, why does a story of Jesus' childhood when he's 12 years old come before Epiphany? Epiphany is the celebration of the Magi arriving at the toddler Jesus' house there in Bethlehem. So why, why does this story of the 12-year-old Jesus come before the story of the toddler Jesus? Uh, To to put it simply, it's this. Uh, We don't want to miss 
the in-between years. Uh, Truthfully, once we get to the season of Epiphany, uh, the church calendar has quickly moved on to the ministry of Jesus, and we miss his childhood completely. Uh, There really aren't a lot of stories, interestingly, not a lot of stories of Jesus' childhood. Most of them carried by the Gospel of Luke, one of them carried by Matthew. Uh, but, But these three stories, they have something to tell us and teach us about the kingdom that Jesus wants to usher in. So uh, let's get there. Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Now, just so we're clear, verses 41 through 48, uh, they're really just the setup for the main show, right? We're going to discover Mary and Joseph here at the beginning that they're pious people, that they are about observing the law. So every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And like most families, friends, like most families of the ancient Near East, they traveled in caravans. And so when Mary and Joseph and Jesus, along with the whole family, when they head into Jerusalem, they have a party. Everybody comes with them as they celebrate God's incredible rescue of the Israelites from the hand of slavery. And that same party, that same caravan, heads then from Jerusalem back to the place where they're going, back to Nazareth. And on the way back, Mary and Joseph, they discover that Jesus is not with them. Now, we we could pause, I guess, just long enough to think, why didn't they notice this before? Right? did they, did they not pick up that Jesus wasn't in the caravan? Like, I mean, we could spend all kinds of hours trying to figure out why Mary and Joseph didn't know that Jesus uh, was with them. But that's not the point of the story. And we shouldn't get caught up in those details. It's enough to know that it would have been a huge crowd, most of whom was probably their family. And so they trusted at some level that Jesus was, was just with, you know, like, fourth cousin whoever, right? With fourth cousin Bob. He's just going with Bob. It's fine. But they move on, and they move on quickly. And so Mary and Joseph, in these opening verses, they look frantically for Jesus. And what do they do? They retrace their steps in the same way that you and I do when we lose our keys. Like, well, where did you have him last, right? Where was Jesus the last time you saw him? And so they go backwards doing all the things that we do when we lose our keys or when we can't find our phone, right? And upon then the return to Jerusalem, they find Jesus in the temple. They find Jesus in the temple. Now, what's fascinating about this uh, is verse 46. So verse 46 says this, after three days... They found him in the temple. It took him three days. Three days to find Jesus. Now, I, I would lose my mind if I couldn't find my keys for three days. Three days, they're searching frantically uh, for Jesus. And again, we could get caught up in why it took them so long finally to get to the temple. But again, not the point. Uh, we don't want to get sidetracked by all the things that are happening in our head. After three days, they find him in the temple. Now, it is a question that they, when they arrive, right, when they arrive, I wonder what Jesus is thinking in the moment. Like, did he care that his parents have been wandering for days? Or was he like most tweens that I know, like only concerned about himself, right? Doesn't have a care in the world about anybody else's opinion, right? About anybody else, no, just them. Uh, was he concerned for his parents? Uh, was he was he just losing track of time, which t- tweens are prone to do? Right? Was he was he more fascinated by what he wanted to do rather than what his parents wanted him to do? Like, I, I wonder. I wonder if at some level, when they arrive, they're thinking like, "What were you thinking, Jesus?" Now I know that my parents often asked me that question when I was pre-teenage and teenage and probably into my 20s. Like, what were you thinking? Right? What is it you were thinking? I mean, this, this is just the way 
of tweens, right? When I was a tween, I remember very clearly that my dad would often describe me as having tood. Now, that was, that was his way of saying attitude, but in a way that was, I don't know, unique. You have tood. Like, by shortening the word, somehow that, that made it worse. I, I don't know, but I distinctly remember, it's like, you have a lot of tood today. I wonder again, Mary and Joseph, are they thinking, you have a lot of tood, Jesus, to sit here for three days and keep us worried. Now, here's the thing. The story moves on pretty quickly, again, in order to help us see that all of these questions that we might might wonder about Mary and Joseph and about Jesus, that they're really not the point. But the point is, the point is coming. So let's, let's start again in verse 46. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. But when his parents saw him, they were astonished. Uh, astonished at what? Astonished by what? Is it his lack of respect, his obvious care for himself rather than the care for his parents? Or were they astonished by his understanding and his dialogue with the teachers of the law, his questions to them and his answers? They ask, son, Why have you treated us this way? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And now, sisters, brothers, we get to the point. Why is it the point? Well, these are arguably the first recorded words that Jesus ever speaks. Now, now lots of us, we tend to think of Jesus' first words spoken as a 30-year-old teacher because we spend so much time in his ministry, and that's appropriate. But the first recorded words of Jesus that Luke is pulling as a historian are these words. So the first thing that Jesus is going to utter on earth is this. So here we are, to the point. Jesus says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Now, this, this phrase, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house, it, it probably has more meaning than just I had to be in the temple. It probably also means, right, it's, it's necessary, Jesus is saying, to be among God's people. It's, it's necessary to be about the father's things. Uh, Those of you who grew up on the King James version of the scripture uh, would read this and say, I have to be about my father's business. Didn't you know that it was necessary that I be in the place where God dwells? Didn't you know that it was necessary that I would be among God's people? Didn't you know that it was necessary that I would be about his ways? Didn't you know that it is necessary that I'm going to be about my father's business. Now, there are two important things for us this morning. And here's the first. Uh, Jesus is giving us a prophetic picture, a prophetic picture of what is to come. You see, he is on the cusp of adulthood from a, from a Jewish perspective. And Jesus is foreshadowing what his life is going to be about. His life is going to be about his father's business. It's going to be about the father's ways. Jesus himself would say later, I will only do what I see the father doing. Right? Jesus is giving us a picture of his life work, of bringing God's kingdom, that kingdom of heaven, to earth. He's giving us a picture of what the prophets have foretold, that he will be about the, the healing of the blind, 
the liberation of the captive, the, the forgiving of those with sin, that he will be about life and power. He's giving us a, a foretaste of the feast that is to come, of the one who will be about restoring the relationship between God and people. Yes, even tween Jesus is giving us a picture that he has to be, that it's necessary for him to be about his father's business, to be in his father's ways, even if it means, even if it means death on a cross. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing to, to Christians, to brothers and sisters in the town of Philippi, he says this, and I wonder, I wonder when he writes this, if he doesn't have in his mind's eye this picture of Jesus in the temple, talking to Mary and Joseph, and insisting that it's necessary to be about his father's ways. Paul says this, Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself and he took the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found then in that human form, He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. It's necessary to be about the Father's business. It is necessary to be in the Father's ways. It is necessary to do what the Father has ushered me in to do. Paul goes on, he says, therefore God has highly exalted him and he's bestowed on him the name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow both in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even even tween Jesus is giving us a picture of what is to come. That his life will be about his father's business But his life will be about being amongst God's people. That his life would be about doing what God has him to do. The first thing we have to learn in this particular text is simply to see that Jesus is giving us a picture of what is to come. The second thing that we have to learn this morning catches us in verse 52. So move, move forward just to verse 52. It says, and Jesus grew up and he increased in wisdom and in favor with God and with people. I think lots of us tend to believe that spiritual formation just sort of happens instantaneously. Uh, but the picture here is that even Jesus had a growth process Even Jesus grew in his wisdom. Even Jesus grew in his favor with God. Even Jesus grew in his favor with other people. Spiritual maturation, spiritual formation is a process, and it is a process that even Jesus underwent. You and I have something to learn here. That if, that if we want to be If we want to be like Jesus, if we want to be in his ways, if we want to grow in wisdom and in favor with God and with people, then it will be necessary for you and me to be in God's house. It'll be necessary to be amongst God's people, and it will be necessary to be about the things of the Father's business, it will be necessary to be in the way. As we turn the calendar year, as we think forward to 2022, I love writing goals. I love reflecting on what it is God's given me and how it is he's going to use it into the future. Now, I, I, I don't know if you're goal writers. I don't know if you think, hey, resolutions are a good thing, or you think, I've tried that, it didn't work, so no. But friends, here in verse 52, I think we have a goal for 2022. 
that you and I ought to rest in the Father's ways, that we ought to be about the Father's business, that it's necessary for you and for me to be in God's house, to come to his table where he's going to feed us again, that life that he has for us in bread and wine and body and blood, it's, it's necessary for you and me to be with one another. So friends, as we plot the course for the year to come, I'm wondering if one of the things perhaps you write down or one of the things you commit to is to the things that Jesus was committed to, of being here, of being with God's people, of being in his word so that we can rest in his ways, so that you and I, like Jesus, can grow not in tude, but in wisdom and in favor, both with God and with people. So church, as we endeavor to put one foot in front of the other in this new year, as we rest in this Christmas tide of a God who would come into our midst. Friends, may we be about the Father's business to His glory and to His glory alone. Amen? And so may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding may guard and keep our hearts in Christ Jesus and His ways today and every day. Amen.